My name is Thomas B. Warren. I'm a minister of the gospel of Christ. I'm certainly delighted that you're in our audience today. And I'd like for you to, to study with us the final lesson in a series of five on what do I owe myself and what do you owe yourself. This has been based upon a passage found in the 22nd chapter of the gospel according to Matthew, beginning with verse 34 and going on through verse 40. On this occasion, we have some Pharisees, Jewish leaders, after having heard that Jesus had put the Sadducees to, si uh, to silence, gathered themselves together and the lawyer asked him a question. He was trying to tempt him, trying to get him into a dilemma. And he said, Teacher, what is, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second like it is this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments the whole law hangeth and the prophets. Now our study together in regard to this matter has been to look at some implications in regard to this matter. If we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves, there are three basic loves, the love of God, the love of neighbor, and the love of self. What obligations do we have to ourselves? Let's think about it from that standpoint. We have the obligation, of course, to God. We have the obligation to our neighbor. What obligation do we have to ourselves? I plead with you to think about it. How, what exactly do you owe yourself in the light of this teaching? I suggest to you, first of all, and we have a summary here of the things that we've covered in the preceding four lessons, we have the obligation to seek the highest good in life. You owe it to yourself not to be satisfied with a second-rate life. You can, of course, if you wish, live a second-rate life, even if you have great riches, even if you have great power, and even if you have great fame, and so on. Even if you can indulge yourself in every fascination of the flesh. The fact that you have these things does not mean you're living a great life. The only great life is one which puts God first. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. So you must treasure your life, realizing that someday you'll give account to God in judgment and that your life is precarious. You do not even know the moment that death may overtake you. And when you die, nothing can be done about preparing yourself any further to meet God. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. Each of us owes it to himself to be ready to meet God in judgment every moment of our lives. You owe it to yourself to treasure the truth, John 8, 32. To treasure your influence as a Christian, because you function as a letter for other people to read in regard to Christ. You should treasure your mind, your mind that has the ability to learn the words and the messages of the Bible, to learn how to reason correctly in regard to the things the Bible teaches. You have a great uh, obligation to treasure your soul. God tells us that every soul is worth more than this whole world, Matthew 16, 26. You owe it to yourself to treasure the church, the one church, the body of Christ, which Jesus bought with his blood, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. In the next place, you owe it to yourself to know what you ought to know, to know God and Christ, to know them as they are revealed in the Bible, as they are revealed in nature, according to Romans 1, and as they are revealed in the Bible, John 17 and 3. You owe it to yourself to know the truth, John 8, 32. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free to know your neighbor, to know that he is valuable in the sight of God, to know that he, like you, is a sinner. And you owe it to yourself to know yourself. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. In the third place, we note that you owe it to yourself to be what you ought to be. You ought to be a Christian. You ought to be a faithful Christian. And you ought to be happy as a Christian. It's not enough just to be a religious person. It isn't enough just to be a good moral person. Every one of us should be a good moral person. We should be sincere in it, but that isn't sufficient. In order for one to be with God in eternity, you must obey the gospel of Christ as a penitent believer being baptized into Christ, and the Lord will add you to the church for which he died. 
and then you must live a faithful Christian life. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee the crown of life. To live a life of holiness, Hebrews 12 and 14, without which no man shall see the Lord. You owe it to yourself to be happy as a Christian. In nothing be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passes understanding shall guard your hearts and thoughts in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Casting all your anxieties upon him, for he careth for you. He is taking care of you. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. In the next place, you owe it to yourself to love what you ought to love. To love God foremost, above all, above everything else. To love truth. If you do not love the truth, you will be lost. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10. To love your brothers and sisters in Christ if you are a Christian. 1 John 4.20 makes clear that if you do not love your brothers and sisters in Christ, you cannot love God. If you don't love your brethren whom you have seen, you certainly will not love God whom you have not seen. You owe it to yourself to love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. And even though you know that you're a sinner and you still love yourself, just so you can't say, well, if my neighbor were not a sinner, I would love him. He's a sinner, you're a sinner. You love yourself, you also can love your neighbor in the sense of wishing him well. You should love your spouse, your wife, or your husband. Uh, Christ loved the church, and husbands are taught to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Wives are to love their husbands, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. We're even to love our enemies, as, as Paul taught in Romans chapter 12, verses 20 and 21 and we're to love ourselves. Sometimes people get to the point they hate themselves so, they even murder themselves, they commit suicide. What a terrible thing to do. We need to lean upon God, and we need to lean upon God's people, upon other people who can help us to live a life of joy, and a life of service to God and our fellow man. You owe it to yourself in the next place to think what you ought to think. Think of God's word. Psalms 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Philippians 4 and 8, Whatsoever things are of lovely, honorable, true, of good report, so on, think on these things. Do not think on matters of hatred. Uh, do not think on matters of lust. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 28. Guard your mind, keep it pure and holy. You must have a sincere heart. Do not be a hypocrite. Do not pretend to be what you are not, but to strive to be as strong and sincere as God can help you to be. In the next place, you owe it to yourself to do what you ought to do. You ought to do the will of God. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. In other words, it's not enough just to be religious, just to lift up your hands toward heaven and cry out, Oh, Lord Jesus, how I love you but you must do the will of God. Recall the words of Jesus, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. You must have a living faith. Faith without works is dead. Faith without acts of obedience. Not acts of obedience whereby we earn our salvation, but acts of obedience to the gospel of Christ. Works of flesh. Works alone cannot save, faith alone cannot save. It must be coupled together. Faith made perfect by works. Faith made alive by works. James chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. We should love and then work. John, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's foolish self-deception for one to convince himself that he loves God when he's not willing to submit his life and his will to the commandments of God. In fact, Jesus made clear in this passage, we just noted that if you do love him, you will obey him in everything that you know to be his will. In 1 John 5 and 3, for this is the love of God that you keep his commandments. I pray for all of us that we not give ourselves credit for loving God we're not, when we are not willing to be obedient to his will. 
You owe it to yourself to do what you ought to do, to do everything in all good conscience. There are no occasions where it is right for you to violate your conscience. While it is not enough, it's not sufficient for one to be saved to act in good conscience. While the Apostle Paul acted in good conscience while he was persecuting Jesus by persecuting the members of the church for which Jesus died. But Paul said that he'd lived in all good conscience until that day, doing what he felt was right, but he was wrong nevertheless. One can be wrong and be lost while he lives in all good conscience. And so you ought to do what you ought to do, what you are to do according to the will of God, and you are to give what you ought to give. First of all, give yourselves, as the Macedonian Christians did, as recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. They gave generously, even though they were in the very depths of poverty. That no doubt meant they didn't give a great deal of amount, but they gave generously according to what they had. But first of all, and no doubt the thing that enabled them to give so generously, they gave themselves to God. You owe it to yourself, and I owe it to myself, to give ourselves to God. To give of ourselves first, and then to give of our possessions, to give of our time. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. That means buying up the opportunity. While you have opportunity to work, to spread the gospel of Christ, and to live according to it yourself, Take advantage of that. Do not waste your time. Do not let your life simply slip away from you without living in obedience to the will of God. In the next place, you owe it to yourself to be satisfied with what you have. Now, many of us do not have a great deal of money. We know people in the world that have millions. We know of other people who have simply billions of dollars. But you notice at least more often than not, these people are not really happy. They have put their allegiance somewhere that it doesn't belong. We hear the question, what is he worth? And somebody says, $10 billion. And other people are envious. But no man who is a Christian and a faithful one need be envious of anybody, no matter how much money he has, how much power he has, no matter how famous, no matter how many people want his autograph, no matter how people many rush to hear him sing or to watch him on the movie screen or on the television screen, we must not allow ourselves to be simply dissatisfied with our, with our being a faithful Christian. Be satisfied with what you have. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13, said that he had learned in whatsoever state he found himself therein to be content. There were occasions, he said, in his life when he had more than he needed and other times that he didn't have enough. But in either situation, he was content. He was happy. Sometimes he was in prison. But nevertheless, he and, Paul, he and Silas sang hymns at midnight while they were not only in the prison but in stocks. We need to learn to be satisfied with what we have but dissatisfied with what we are. Why should we be dissatisfied with what we are? Can we not ever come to the place and say, I have now arrived? No, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, the Bible tells us that Jesus left us an example that we should walk in his steps. Now, Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. And in this life, we never get to the point that we uh, completely overcome committing at least isolated acts of sin. A great deal of difference between walking in the light and committing a sin now and then through weakness and one who deliberately turns away from light to darkness, who willfully sins, who makes up his mind to say, I no longer really care about God. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to do all the sins I want to do, no matter what the Bible says. So you see, we learn to be satisfied, or we should, we owe it to ourselves, to be satisfied with what we have so far as our money and our possessions, material possessions in this life, but we need to be dissatisfied with what we are because with each passing day, we, become, we can become closer and closer to being the example that Jesus gave us. He is our example. And we're taught in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, to keep on growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let none of us get to the point that we say, well, I've climbed and climbed up the spiritual hill, 
and now I'm going to level off and be satisfied with the height that I've reached. No, we should never do that because above us is always the perfect example of Jesus. And we can each day improve over what we were the day before. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. In the next place, we note that we are to value the present moment. Owe it, we owe it to ourselves to value this moment right now. No matter what your situation is, even if you are ill, even if you should know that you're dying, you can value that present moment. For it is an opportunity to lay hold on the grace of God. The grace of God is offered to everybody. The grace of God hath appeared, said Paul in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, bringing salvation to all men. You can be saved, but you must learn what the Bible teaches about it. You must learn the gospel plan of salvation in the New Testament, and you must obey it. And this involves your believing in God, believing in Jesus Christ as his son, repenting of your sins, changing your mind about it, confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, as the Son of God, and being baptized, immersed in water unto the remission of your sins, rising from that grave of water, a child of God, added with the Lord to the church for which Jesus died, and live faithfully unto death. Whatever your point in life, value this present moment to do the very best you can with it to be faithful to God. Life is fleeting. Death is certain. It's certain to come unless Christ comes first. And in another sense, it's uncertain. None of us knows when we shall die. Think of the present moment. You have something to do about your life. We all do. We can all strive to be better tomorrow than we have been today. We should worship. We owe it to ourselves to worship as we ought to worship. We should worship God according to the words of Jesus in John 4, 24, in spirit and in truth. To worship him with the right attitude. To stand before God in awe, with reverential awe, profound respect mingled with awe. To realize we are worshiping the eternal God. The God who created the heavens and the earth, who created man. There was not one thing created but what was created through the word who became flesh, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ. We must worship God in truth, doing only those things that are authorized, doing all the things that he demands of us, but nothing that he does not authorize, that he has not allowed us to do by his sacred word. It's so very important to do that. In 2 John verses 9 to 11, the Bible says, Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. You owe it to God to trust, to yourself, to trust in whom you should trust. You should not trust in yourself. You should not trust in other people. You shouldn't trust in your money. You shouldn't trust in your power or in your fame, but you should trust in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Don't lean on other people from the standpoint of leaving out God but trust in God. Do it with all of your heart. In all of your relationships, in all of your situations, do not allow yourself to be drawn away from God. You owe it to yourself to do that. You owe it to yourself not to grow weary in well-doing, <clears throat> to realize that what we sow, we shall reap. Every one of us is sowing either to the flesh or to the spirit. There's no way we can escape that. And every one of us is going to reap either, either everlasting life or everlasting destruction and punishment. Every one of us will reap more than we sow. We, we live in this life only a few years, maybe 50, 60, or even 100 years. But in eternity, there will be no end to us. You never can get rid of yourself. You must be faithful unto death. If you are in the judgment to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. Do not let fame or fortune, do not let adversity, do not let a hard situation or illness destroy you, but trust in God. You owe it to yourself to realize that you cannot defeat the ultimate will of God. You can sin against his will. You can reject the gospel plan of salvation, but you cannot reject God's will to bless the, the righteous uh, eternally and to punish the wicked eternally. May God bless you as we've studied together. What do I owe myself?